So this one is picking up on some of the things that we have, has probably come up all the way through this afternoon. Um, and I've titled it Mind the Gap. Um, and I don't know how international this is, but I know this is an international audience. So Mind the Gap is what we hear all the time in, in, um, in the UK on trains, kind of being caref- meaning being careful and paying attention to that step. So really what I'm I'm saying with that is it's about planning and just being aware and and thinking about that step and just being mindful of that. Um, So what do I mean by transition? So transition is often, is what we often mean when we talk about transition is that move between children and adult services in healthcare. And I know Oliver brought that up earlier um, in terms of um, that being, being, something to be sort of mindful of but what I want to do in this talk is think a lot more widely around that time about managing the time when people move from being a child to being an adult and again a bit of a disclaimer on this one Um, so I think it it's really difficult obviously I'm I've done talks like this before but could give a lot more specifics in terms of England and Wales um, and organizations and things like that I'm not an expert in all the systems in in every country. Um, And I think the other thing that's difficult is obviously with juvenile HD, everyone will start that sort of journey, be at a different point in their condition when they start that journey. Um, But certainly I think most people with juvenile HD, these will be issues that come up at some point, at whatever point um, they do. Um, So I'm thinking about it more widely. I'm thinking about healthcare, but also things like education, employment, social, um, so peer relation, relationships, finances, housing, it, re- it obviously affects everything as you become an adult, so it's a huge area. Um, so really what I'm hoping to do today is give a few sort of things to think about um, and hopefully you know, we can always help signpost in terms of kind of some of the more, more detail. Um, but really what I want to look at is what happens when you have a progressive condition while you're navigating all of this huge area. Um, so don't worry about this slide lots of lots of small writing um, but really what I wanted to do again is just pick up on what I was saying that actually depending on when this when the symptoms start where you are where you're at in your journey um, is going to um, influence things and the whole process it's important to remember that there are things that are going on in terms of development that are things that um, are things to think that that will be impacted so looking at early adolescence i'll just pick out a few bits from this you know you've got so you've got physical changes happening you've got changes in behavior and you've got changes in thinking um, then as we move on you know there's there's other things going on in terms of relationships changes in relationships and, and the importance of peer relationships um, things you know the, the famous sort of risky um, behaviours um, and again when a condition impacts at that time it's going to have a different get different impact and then later so later adolescence again it's it's moving to that sort of um, adult in terms of maybe financial independence thinking more about the future identity um, and some of those changes so as I said, I think a lot of it is about just thinking ahead and planning for some of those changes um, when we're talking about um, having, having um, juvenile HD at the same time. And thinking ahead can be hard. You know, we don't, we can't, t- no one can say, this is what's going to be happening at this point. Um, so thinking again, again um, ahead can be hard. Uh, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen and exactly when. So my key tip, for, which I'll come back to at the end, but I think my real key tip is what you can do is you can build your team. You know, you can make those connections. Um, so whether that's a, a centre of excellence, a specialist Huntington's team, whether it's um, a paediatrician, whether it's a team within the school, building your team, the people that you can go to um, who can help with that, um, and think about some things, and I'll highlight some of the things that I think it's worth thinking about. But then once you've done that, you can take each day as it comes, and you can, but you know you've got the network and the resources to then manage any of those, um, those things that come up. So 
the first area, so I'll go through some of the areas that I picked up on before. So the first one is healthcare. Um, and I've sort of put this from the pond into the sea. Um, because it can feel like that, and Oliver mentioned about that move from children's to adult services. It can, and I've certainly been in meetings where there's maybe sort of 25 professionals um, supporting someone as a child, and then I look at them and think, actually, in a couple of years' time, none of these people are actually going to be involved. So that's going to mean a whole new group of people, a whole new team, um, who you may have built relationships up with over a long period of time. Um, so, again, everyone's, the different systems will vary, but I would say proactive planning from, from 14 and thinking ahead to that is really important. Um, the other thing that I would say, just to um, rem be aware of, that I've seen be um, difficult in a couple of situations, was where actually that time when you've got maybe the children's team stepping back and the adult team, haven't, you haven't really got to know the adult team, Actually, that can be a time when there's lots of change going on. Um, so it's just being aware of that. Um, and again, if that transition can happen smoothly, so maybe you, you sort of have that neat sort of um, introduction to maybe the adult team, it helps build that relationship. Um, on the positive side, I think sometimes actually moving into adulthood means that um, you can have a lot of, as Lauren was saying, that the team in London um, at UCL, they wouldn't normally see um, children, so they're an adult team. Um, and a lot of the HD teams will be based within adult services, probably you know, internationally across the world. Um, but the other thing just to be mindful of is suddenly if you're, um, you might get very used to, as a parent, um, sort of having that helping support um, your child and then young adult with sort of decisions around their care that might not be if, if you're sort of having input in that that might not be questioned and then suddenly when someone becomes an adult there might be questions about well you know whose decision is it and and that can all become quite problematic um, sometimes so again something just to think through and systems will vary about how that's sort of formalized um, but worth thinking about I know I brought this up for those of you who were here before, but school and college um, is, again, a big part of people's lives. Um, so again, kind of how that's impacted will very much depend on how old someone is when they start to develop symptoms, where they've got to. Um, but as I was saying before, often it provides a lot of what, um, what the young person and, and their family need um, in terms of, you know, kind of they're there all day, um, doing some, hopefully something they really enjoy, um, hopefully something that is very um, sort of for their age, um, meeting their friends, um, but equally um, it can be challenging. So again, what I was saying before about sort of building, building support is really important, so that working together. So building up that sort of, getting that plan, again it will vary depending on the country, so in um, the UK, we have um, education and health plans, um, but I think they're IEPs in the States. Um, but getting that set up at an early stage um, is important. There's often, so certainly in the UK, there are often some sort of specialist course or there's some offer up until some point. So whether that's um, 16, whether that's 19, whether that's 21, um, there's usually some sort of offer um, that someone can access until that sort of point. But then there seems to be this sort of big drop-off um, where there's just, then there just doesn't seem to be anything. You know, the options maybe that are open to someone might be much more suited to a much older adult. Um, so I think that transition can be quite hard. And again, it's something worth looking ahead and thinking um, about. So for some people, it might be looking at employment or, or possibly supported employment might be one option. Um, voluntary work has also been um, a good option um, for some people. Now, this is a UK um, organisation, doit.org. Um, as I say, it is a UK thing, but I think the point I wanted to make here is that actually um, what it does is... So it's a website where you put in your... Um, in the UK postcode um, and it will give you lots of options of all the voluntary opportunities that are in your area 
And what I've always been amazed, whenever I do that for someone, what it gives is this whole wealth of opportunities that you just wouldn't necessarily think as voluntary opportunities. So you might think of, I mean, in the UK, a classic might be helping in a charity shop, for example. But actually, when, I've, when you look, it might have helping at an a animal rescue centre, for example. And I've certainly had some young people who have had great experiences kind of with, with voluntary work, doing something they really, really love. Um, but I would say for a lot of people, certainly in the UK, one of the things that I think um, at that point um, is worth looking at is sort of one-to-one -one support. So um, they're supported by someone to do access whatever activity it, they, it is they want. Um, so in the UK, we might get funding to have a sort of a personal assistant. Um, and I'd say that's probably the most sort of common in terms of kind of the option um, at that point. And then finances. So again, thinking ahead about kind of who will manage finances. And again, I think this will probably, the systems vary in different countries, but there will be a, a system of, of appointeeship or, or saying, actually, I I'm, I'm want this person to manage my finances if that's becoming tricky. Um, it's also a time when government benefits might change. So um, in England, we have um, young people transition from something called disability living allowance. So this is the government benefit if you have a disability um, to personal independence payment. Scotland, um, that's recently changed, so um, child disability payment and adult disability payment, people will transition again around the same age. Um, so I'm no expert on kind of other countries, but just the couple, so US and Australia, um, you've got SSI and Medicaid um, and Australia child disability payment and disability support pension. But the key point here is that often in, in every system, there's often this... Um, sort of change over in, in terms of uh, benefit system. Housing is another area. So as the young, as someone's um, getting older and kind of what their options are. So a lot of people will be living with family. Um, I've had some people who have had a sort of a supported living set up where they might um, have their own sort of flat but have people on site that are sort of supporting them. Um, or residential care for some, some, in some situations. You know, everyone's setup varies, so what, what is right for one person and will be very different from another. Um, but I think in all of those, I think what's really key is thinking of ways to include appropriate space and independence for someone. Um, so I've had all sorts of great sort of um, setups with someone having their own sort of um, summer house or a bachelor pad, different setups, but where people building in that sort of space, privacy and independence um, is important. And then respite's another key area. So, and I've kind of highlighted appropriate respite breaks. So, as I said earlier, you know, it needs to be a win-win for everyone. And I think the problem is that certainly in the UK, you go from when, you, when you're older than 18, you might have some great options, um, sort of, you know, thinking along the lines of um, sort of children's services, but then it all, everything again moves to that where everyone seems much older, older adults, and it doesn't seem quite right. Um, and that, having something that's a win-win for everyone is really important. Um, in the UK, we do have some um, sort of hospice services that provide respite for, for young adults, but they're... Um, they're few and far between. They're absolutely amazing if you're lucky enough, um, but they are few and far between. Um, so things like that might exist. But I'd say a lot of people as well have had um, got, used services like um, sort of activity holidays for those with disabilities. So I've had people use, again in the UK, things like Revitalise and the Calvert Trust. So these are um, holiday centres for people with disabilities. And they've either been able to go on their own or with a carer um, to support them. Um, and it has been a really great option. Um, and another option that I've seen, not often, but has been quite, a, um, quite successful for some people, is where, it's sort of where so, um, they, people have another family that they kind of go and have a, have a break with. And that's been really successful for some people. So a slightly different, sometimes there are these slightly different ideas that you might not have thought of 
um, which might be options. Um, the other thing, again, there are lots, again, across the world, there are uh, sort of children's wish charities um, who can make, do, you know, organise holidays or special, special activities. Um, I would say, particularly if you're at an age where you might be moving over quite soon to that sort of um, over adult, look and maybe apply earlier. Um, it's something that, um, you know, if there's a cutoff, you might just have the chance to be able to apply. Um, there are also some which will do um, wishes for adults. So again, in, in the UK, we have places like Purple Heart Wishes, um, the Willow Foundation. And I know there are, I think I looked in terms of kind of what there was in the US and there were a, a couple there. Um, so it's definitely worth looking out for those because they can make some really, you know, make some really nice activities possible. Um, the other thing I'd say is be creative. You know, I've had um, young people who have gone and done skiing, for example. There, are special, there was a special organisation that did sort of skiing with support. Um, so, you know, there really are huge numbers of options out there and it's worth kind of um, thinking, what do I want to do? And then probably in one way or another, it may well be possible. Um, so, yeah, don't be, um, keep your mind open and um, let's see what we can make possible. Um, and I've also put on there, connect with the, the community as well. Um, I know I mentioned earlier, for those of you that were here, about our weekend. Um, but and I, and I mentioned about kind of um, online calls and things you know I think it can be again a really powerful way and this is a photo from our last year's weekend um, so it can be really special times as well those times like being here um, when we can all connect also I just wanted to sort of um, you know there will be difficult conversations that come up along the way um, and I think it's certainly something that we talk about and think about um, with adults with HD. And I think it's important that we sort of recognise that here um, and that we have that, those conversations. I think sometimes it can be harder to know quite what le you know, when to start, start talking um, and what to talk about when. Um, but it is important to, to recognise that there will be those, those conversations. And again, then there might be a system about of, of sort of formally recognising who as you know who you want as you become an adult. The system will change as to what you do in terms of formalising, um, as I said, with healthcare and with finances around who who's going to help you make decisions if that's difficult. Um, it might be also things that um, maybe doing as as kind of part of our support suddenly becomes a little bit kind of questioned. I've had sort of various situations where once someone becomes over, you know, once someone's over 18 and um, is an adult, where things, that, things are questioned. So again, there might be systems, th things that need to be considered. Um, now, this is just a quote um, from the HDSA Guide to Juvenile HD. Um, again, just recognizing that actually there's all sorts in terms of um, going on as people people are growing up um, and some of those things can be can be tricky for everyone um, to navigate um, so there might be changes in terms of friendships um, and peer relationships um, and relationships generally um, risk taking um, another one um, sex education, managing physical changes, all of these are really difficult topics and I'm not going to um, kind of stand here and try and give, give answers, but just raising those as things that may need to be thought through and it may, may need sort of help and support with. Um, and it is important to have the conversations um, and um, kind of respect that that's part of becoming an adult as well. Um, the other thing I just want to do um, is recognise around siblings as well. Um, you know, I can't do a talk like this without kind of acknowledging kind of brothers and sisters in all of this. And this picture actually is one that um, the sister of a, a 
young man with juvenile HD drew for me. Um, and I've always kept it there as my little reminder on my board. Um, it sits above my desk. Just a reminder of kind of the brothers and sisters in everything um, as well. So with siblings, obviously, you know, I was talking about kind of open communication and having those conversations. And it's just recognising that also, you know, as every, everyone is growing up at that, at that point as well. So, you know, the information that a sibling might need as well might be developing and changing. Um, they might need information around their understanding of genetics and being at risk themselves, potentially. Um, you know, some people where they're, where, you know, if they have a sibling with juvenile HD, might be sort of asserting then, you know, they might minimise their own needs or they might be trying to kind of assert them loudly. But a lot of them will be putting their life on hold as well. Um, they might be supporting their sibling, um, so it might be young carers as well. Um, so I think finding ways for them to be the sibling but still be included is important. And supporting them in their own transitions um, is important as well. So, um, again, I just wanted to include, um, so just to, Joshua, your moment has come. Um, so. <laughs> Diagnosed with Huntington's disease in 2016. It suspected me because I had to read about the aggression, depression, and my speech was slow. I then later found out that I had a gene, a GHD gene in 2017. The reason I expected that one was because of the fact that I still had slow speech and my depression was other and other stuff. For me, I like to describe it as a kind of pick and mix of different diseases. Same kind of thing as Huntington's disease. Like, for example, I like to explain to people that I haven't heard of it. It's a disease with multiple symptoms of different multiple mental illnesses, like Parkinson's, ADHD, bipolar, and so forth. I really enjoy playing games, listening to music, or singing as well. And I also really enjoy going for walks or drinks with my friends. I find it really hard to meet a girlfriend, because whenever I tell them about their gene, most of them just can't deal with it, or will say, and it will give me excuses why they don't believe me. So that makes it hard. But as well as that, sometimes I've got like a difficulty with my friends. If I like, for example, if I get a gas out, they will all, they will, like leave me for a while, but they always come back if I say I'm sorry. The same with my family. Whenever my genes, or sorry, whenever my symptoms are act up. They will always be there afterward. Well, for me, I think it would have been good to have all the knowledge I've got right now to, and send it to me back then. Because that way I would have known more about what's going on with me, you know, what to expect in the future as well. Because I thought I would have been gone by now. I was kind of scared of it. But now I'm still here. I'm still fighting. For me, gaming helps because it actually helps with my symptoms. Because uh, gaming can help your cognitive abilities as well as like mental helping. Well, I don't really work or anything. I just stay inside playing games all the time. I did used to go to college, but I didn't go continue after I found out. I just been inside all the time, and my mom left her job, so she'd be a full time care for me and take care of me, which was really nice. And sometimes, like I said, my relationship with my friends is a bit rough, but we always get through it because I've got great friends and family. Don't give up, just keep fighting. Even if you get told you've only got a couple of years left, keep fighting. Try and make a positive environment because that'll be a major difference for you. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Do, we, do you want to take, see if anyone's got any questions at the end? Or do you want to do, 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 we say, do, yeah. do it now? Yeah, do you want to do it now? I don't know if anyone's got any, any questions they wanted to ask Josh.
Oh. What type of video games do you like? I would like to play Nintendo. I've recently played Hogwarts Legacy. Oh, Hogwarts Legacy. Okay. Oh, what else? Five 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 do you ever feel guilty for keeping a few tails in the house up? Not including the cats? <laughs> Not when you're shouting at your games? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it's a no. It's a positive environment for you. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Oh, there might be some questions at the end as well. Thank you. Um, no, I really appreciate you doing that, Josh. I think it, it was. Um, so, just this is really just wrapping up then. So, um, I really like this quote. Don't worry, kids. Being an adult is mostly just googling how to do stuff, and it's very true. Um, so. I think we can see, you know, whatever point that, almost at whatever point, if Huntington's affects you, if you have juvenile HD, it will impact on transitions in some way or another. Um, and no one has all the answers. You know, as I gave my disclaimer at the beginning, I'm, it's difficult to sit out and say, this is what's going to happen, or this is, what's going, this, is the, this is what you need to do, because it will vary. Everyone's situation varies. Um, and it will be different for every person and different in every country. So as, as I said at the start, I think my key tip is do the planning, build your team, but then you can take each day as it comes um, and hopefully focus on, as, as Josh, has, Josh said, you know, keep fighting and living each day as it comes. Um, and that's the end.